morning. Welcome to this session on cyber security, uh, cyber certification and standards. Uh, my name's Chris Mitchell. I'm chairing this session. Uh, there are actually three of us on the session and I'll start by introducing my colleagues on the session. Uh, firstly, we have Tamara Tafra, who's Councillor for Cyber Issues uh, and Permanent Representation of Croatia to the EU. Since 2013, Tamara has been working for the permanent representation of Croatia to the EU, covering uh, a number of acronyms, which I won't read out, but I'm sure uh, you can find more on the website. She's currently the councillor for cyber issues and will be chair of the Horizontal Working Party on cyber issues. The second uh, member of today's panel is John France, who's head of industry security at the GSMA. He's been with the GSMA since 2008, having held several technical positions and moving into his current position in 2018. He's responsible for leading this fraud and security function within the GSMA. And again, there's more about him that you can read, I believe, on the website. Uh, I'm Chris Mitchell, as I just said. I, I'm a professor of computer science at Royal Holloway, University of London, where I've been for the last 30 years. Uh, I've in fact worked in security and cryptography for over 40 years and I've been active in international security standardization for over 30. And I have a particular long-standing interest in security of mobile communications. So that's the introductions. Uh, we'll each talk for a few minutes about our own views on certification and standards and then move to a more uh, conversational style where perhaps we address any questions that come in and indeed I'll ask a few questions uh, of my fellow panelists uh, if time allows. Okay so let's start by looking at what security certification is about. We've been doing certification of one kind or another for security reasons for decades. In fact, we can trace the origin back to the, the Orange Book and then more recently to the Common Criteria, which is a system that was originally devised and has been largely used by governments who are seeking to procure security related equipment and want some guarantees that the equipment has certain security properties. But of course, they're not the only people interested in security. And so in recent years, there's been, I would say, a great resurgence of interest in certification because we all realize how important security is. And we've also, many of us become aware of how dangerous many of the products are that we've been using. Um, we hear daily about security breaches and so on. And there are two aspects of certification I would like to particularly highlight. And the first is generally products and services that we use are, well, many of them are critical for the wider society. And as a result, having assurance in their security properties is very important before we deploy them. And that's the role of, certi one of the roles of certification is to give assurance to the consumer of services and products that their properties are as they should be. Of course, in some cases, if a product fails, it's rather less important. Um, and so perhaps we don't need a high level of certification, but nonetheless, there are still safety issues and there may be financial issues. But generally speaking, the degree to which we rely on technology or services or systems needs to be established before we decide on the need and the level of product certification. And the second thing that we need to think about is who certification is aimed at, whether it's the consumer, the service provider themselves, or regulators. And so one aspect, one example that we can think about in the terms of thinking about the consumer is uh, in 5G, where there's been a huge amount of recent discussion about providing guarantees in the uh, security properties of 5G infrastructure and individual products and systems. 
So why the interest in five, sudden interest in 5G? Why weren't we interested in 2G, 3G and 4G? Well, there's a general belief that 5G will be transformative and achieve things across vertical industry areas that weren't possible with previous generations of mobile technology. But nonetheless, 4G and previous generations have become a key part of everyday life and indeed uh, commerce and industry. So we might ask why we weren't more interested in certification before. More generally, we need to think about how the pieces of the certification puzzle fit together. And the Cybersecurity Act is a very important recent development, which we'll hear more about from Tamara in just a moment. And of course, it's aimed at the European Union, but those of us who are outside the European Union, whether just recently or never been part, obviously very interested because it will probably provide a framework which we can apply to. Similarly, there's a number of developments for 5G certification, which we'll hear about from John. Uh, there's GSMA's NISAS work and work by 3GPP. And of course, we have long-standing experience with the common criteria. So there are a number of pieces, some of which industry sector specific, some of which more general, like the Cybersecurity Act, and we have to try to work out how they fit together. The one thing that I would like to see thinking about 5G is a common level that we can all agree on is a kind of baseline level of certification, which we can build on uh, in individual countries or individual uh, industry sectors if we feel we need a greater level of assurance than guaranteed by some baseline level of certification. Otherwise, there's a danger that we'll have a plethora of certification schemes and obtaining certification is no doubt costly. So if providers of services and systems have to gain ridiculously large numbers of certifications, uh, this could make life very difficult for them. It could impose huge costs on the providers, which will of course eventually have to be paid by the consumers of service and society in general. In general. Now, I think I've said everything I want to say. I'd like to hand over to the experts, but I think I'd conclude by saying that certification isn't a silver bullet. It's not going to solve everything, but it's a hugely important part of the general picture of providing greater assurance in the operation of security products. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Tamara, who's going to tell us more about the exciting developments in the European Union. Uh, good morning to you all and thank you very much, Chris, and very much grateful for your uh, nice introduction in this very important topic. But as you said, the certification and standardization, it's not the silver bullet, but for sure it's a good step uh, towards uh, more security and more trust, uh, especially here in the European Union, in the digital single market. Uh, this month we will celebrate one year of uh, entering into force uh, of the uh, Cybersecurity Act. Uh, so it was in June last year that this uh, first big uh, regulation regarding the cybersecurity of ICT products, uh, processes uh, and services entered into force and actually uh, started the very important work on uh, certification. Uh, first of all, Cybersecurity Act has uh, two parts. One part gave ANISA, the European Cybersecurity Agency, uh, a stronger mandate. And actually, ANISA is now uh, in the lead for the uh, security and uh, security and uh, uh, certification and standardization uh, process. So uh, the uh, main aim was actually to avoid uh, fragmentation and to have a common approach and common framework, which will be valid EU wide. So when there is a certificate issued in one member state, it's valid through the whole European Union. Uh, we know that uh, the world is looking at us. So the, world, the work on the uh, first certification scheme is already ongoing. Um, it's the um, actually uh, transformation of SOGA S, the uh, certification scheme that already existed for the uh, security of information systems. 
And uh, this is actually the first uh, scheme that we are going to, to, to introduce. But uh, there are some other ideas what uh, is needed to be certificated since the technology is uh, developing very quickly. So uh, for sure, 5G is going to be one of the next steps uh, in our work uh, for the uh, uh, better and secure uh, uh, environment. Um, the um, work of European Cybersecurity Certification Group uh, started last year and uh, despite the COVID-19 crisis, it didn't stop. So the, uh, uh, our colleagues from the member states are working very hardly to, hard to get uh, this uh, first scheme uh, in force. But uh, as said, uh, it's not a silver bullet. Uh, we will, what we need actually is to also ensure that uh, uh, not only the uh, product services and processes are secure, cyber secure, but also that the uh, final users are aware uh, how to use it and uh, that they actually also uh, should be part of all the ecosystem. Uh, so, this is actually uh, a highway, but with several strands. So, uh, let's, say, let's see how can we improve the awareness of the uh, end users uh, uh, that cybersecurity is an important part of their every, everyday life. And I think this current uh, situation and current circumstances that we are all experiencing uh, due to the COVID-19, and that we all move our lives into digital spheres has have has actually showed that uh, digital and security of our digital life is very important. So I'm thinking that now uh, also the um, higher level, the higher political level are aware that uh, certification uh, and standardization of ICT uh, products, processes and services is a very important topic since uh, our life will for sure stay uh, for a longer time in this digital sphere and uh, we are going to use it also in the future more, more often than we have to, have to use it before. Um, I will not go into the 5G certification because uh, the work uh, is just uh, key. We have uh, within the NIS cooperation group uh, a subgroup dealing with uh, 5G standardization and uh, certification, which is in close contact with uh, ECCG, uh, so European Cybersecurity Certification Group at uh, ENISA. And both of them are actually now just starting the explore, exploratory work on the uh, certification and standardization of 5G. What the aim is actually to have uh, a common framework that can be used everywhere so uh, I'm always saying that uh, European Union is actually in some of the regulation leading uh, the, the rest of the world. So, for example, GDPR was such a regulation that has shown that uh, we can sell, so to say, our legislation also beyond the European borders. But uh, I strongly believe that also the uh, Cybersecurity Act uh, is such a legislation that it's not just European one, but it's going to be uh, present uh, also beyond European borders and also accepted beyond European borders. So, and because also the European market is a big one, so it's uh, in the interest of the uh, international companies to uh, have and uh, follow the uh, European uh, leadership, I must say, in this in this very important important uh, area. So, for the beginning, that's all from me. So, I give the world back to you, Chris. Oh, thank you very much, Tamara. Um, uh, well, without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to John, uh, who's going to talk a little uh, about the work of GSMA and the, the certification in particular. John. Thanks, Chris. Uh, hi. Um, uh, good morning to everyone. Hope you're all keeping safe um, in these um, interesting times. Uh, just in case you don't know who the GSMA are, 
Um, we are the Global Mobile Association uh, that represents the mobile industry um, across the world. Um, 700 plus operators, 400 associate members, and a lot of ecosystem players. Um, so firmly rooted in the telecom space. Um, one of the hot topics of discussion is obviously uh, around 5G at the moment. Um, uh, I think we interestingly this the session is titled uh, around cyber. Um, I think the two uh, between telco and and traditional internet the lines are very blurred, if not completely overlapping these days. So it's a relevant conversation for any communications company these days. Um, I'd like to briefly touch on a, on a few things around certification before we get into the discussion element. Um, and picking up on something that Chris was saying, um, which is certification um, is is in service of, of whom? Who does it answer? Um, and I think that's a very good question, which is who, and, and that's a, a, a trust conversation really, rather than about a technical conversation. It's a, uh, how do I raise confidence and trust in, in something to a, uh, to a level that uh, the consumer of that uh, trust can be um, given a level of comfort that they're happy with. So it is quite consumer specific. Um, and I think that drives down to the point that um, a singular certification cannot satisfy everyone. Um, so if we are looking at certification schemes uh, across Europe, which I think is uh, absolutely great, the right thing to do, they necessarily have to be baseline security, uh, which is to, to prove a base and then a specific use case kind of uh, piece of comfort can be added on top. So um, it's not it's not a golden bullet, uh, it's not a silver bullet. Um, and I think there, there are a few bullets that need to be fired in this game um, to get good coverage. Um, the other things is if we look at uh, the landscape, there are sort of three key things that make certification difficult uh, in the modern world. Um, if we look at the number of things and number of suppliers that go into a product or a service uh, these days, they're, they're quite diverse, uh, usually ge geographically dispersed. Um, so many component players. Um, so whereas a singular product, physical product, um, is produced by one factory and is easily certifiable, uh, a digital product is usually contributed to through um, many different technologies, many different contributors, um, systems integrators that plug it in, in together in different ways. So that, that's one complicating factor. Um, Another is actually the, the complexity of the service itself. A um, uh, number of features it offers, um, usually now software-based um, in, in definition. Um, so the complexity of the, the thing or the service is increasing and that makes it harder to, to certify. Uh, and then uh, the third compounding factor we look at is the rate of changes increasing. Um, the, you know, the product life cycles are speeding up. Um, Therefore, anything we do around certification has to account for um, that kind of speed and that, that flexibility um, to, to stay current. So those are sort of some complicating factors in certification. Uh, the other thing about certifications is they tend to be point in time. Um, uh, so sort of a test once, reuse many. Um, so it's, it's a limitation. Um, but also uh, a, a trade-off and, and a necessary trade-off to do with uh, things like time to market um, and the ability to um, give a basic layer without actually getting into test paralysis. Um, so necessary to the point in time. So they give some level of confidence, which they absolutely should do. Um, the other dimension we look at is, um, or should look at, is the actual life cycle. Um, not all things are equal in the life cycle around delivering secure product and service. Um, and it's it's really a, a component parts that have to operate together uh, and collectively uh, deliver a good, secure, um, usable products and services. So through their design, um, in the case of um, 5G, that will be um, 3GPP um, and that side, which will define what that a network uh, should do its feature set uh, through the um, implementation, um, which is how a, a vendor would take that specification, turn it into actually a product line, um, actually through its deployment, um, how an operator may pick that up with a systems integrator, um, 
uh, implement it, configure it, its operation, um, how I uh, use and maintain that, uh, through to its decommission, how we end of life and exit from that. So all the component players through that life cycle have a point to play. Uh, certification can look at uh, um, a number of component parts through that life cycle. Um, so some of the earlier tests are, are relatively easy to execute. Um, but in operation, um, that's usually more around good practice. Um, um, and frameworks uh, again they can be they can be certifications uh, i can pick ones like iso 27001 um, which will say you you can operate something in a, in a secure way you have the procedural knowledge how to do that um, so not all certifications address the same part of the life cycle i think is another another one if we come into a little uh, domain specific knowledge here um, uh, around the GSMA and what it's doing around certification. Uh, we've run a number of certification schemes for quite a while. Um, the security assurance scheme around UICCs, um, what you may know as a SIM card, um, its production and its personalization and its life cycle. Um, we offer some certification schemes around that. So we do have some pedigree in, in knowing how to do this. Uh, that's more on the production side. Uh, Chris mentioned the network equipment security assurance um, scheme uh, or NISAS, which is looking to um, look at network product um, so what a vendor produces um, in terms of a, a box or a function um, how do we assure and um, say that it meets some good baseline criteria it's, it's a baseline proof uh, that also looks at some of the methodology of how, how products are developed in other words do they use secure practices in um, in developing products uh, that's just as important as an operator actually uh, taking that and operating it securely um, I'll come back to sort of my final point on um, certification has an absolute point to play. Um, I think it, it should look to um, give good baseline comfort, uh, number one, uh, has to do that. Number two, it should reduce fragmentation. Um, so what we really don't want to see is 101 different certifications on, on you know, 50 different territories all trying to achieve the same thing. So where we should harmonize and can harmonize, um, we absolutely, I think, have a duty to do that, to come up with uh, good baseline schemes, and then you can build upon those for specific uh, sectorization needs or service needs. Um, it should be the right size for the right outcome. Um, we've seen some schemes that um, have been uh, accused of being um, very technically very good, but very, time intensive to execute and very expensive against um, some discrete product that has low value or low impact on security. Um, so it's got to be right size for the right outcome. Um, and recognize also the complexity in the supply chain, um, the number of component players. And I think that's one of the challenges we face going forward as, um, as the telco industry does. But um, so any digital industry um, definitely uh, faces these kind of challenges. Uh, so that that's kind of what I wanted to cover. Um, it's an interesting topic. It's uh, you know it has some answers. It doesn't have them all. Um, absolutely, something we should do, um, especially as we see um, the rise of services becoming uh, raised into critical national infrastructure as digital uh, as societies digitize and rely on these services for um, economic and um, economic stability um, never more so pr um, as proven as in current times so i'll hand back to chris thank you very much john um well i have a few questions uh, lined up uh, and i'd like to start with one that's come in from uh, a member of the online audience and that's the point of how do we agree on a common level of security um, it's arguably very difficult to do um, and to what degree do we want to achieve a common level of security and how much do we need a, a method for measuring security or, so that we can enable people to say what their requirements are and uh, be assured that, that products and systems meet their requirements? Um, this is a difficult question, obviously. I, mean, I think there is a need. Personally, I think there is a, we can identify a common baseline for many scenarios but it needs to be cases where there's a an identifiable large group of customers 
across which you who have this common requirement, across which you can defray the cost of the certification. And so that there's some point in achieving a certification that it meets a significant number of uh, consumers' needs. So I guess John mentioned the example of 27,001. Um, that's a slightly different kind of certification, but um, it sets up a common process. And it's clearly deemed valuable by the market. Uh, you only have to look at the number of uh, players who achieve 27,001 certification, that it is a worthwhile badge to achieve. And I guess when we're thinking about products and systems, I, I, I think it's almost certainly true that there are large classes of products for which there's an identifiable common baseline. But um, I guess the proof will be in the pudding, but maybe Tamara and John, you'd like to respond. Well, uh, I, I saw the question and it's, I mean, I understand the, the issue of how to determine the, the security. Uh, what I have learned in the last six years following the cybersecurity in the council is that uh, cybersecurity is completely different from the classical physical, let's put it like that, uh, security and uh, not just in this uh, particular area, but also in other areas. So whatever was uh, normal in, in physical world uh, for the cyber world, it's more and more challenging. And uh, for us, what we have learned here is actually that we need to react very quickly because the, the whole uh, 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 cyber uh, area is developing very quickly and, and very speedily. And, and, very spe and speed of the development is uh, uh, somehow very uh, hard to, to catch. So uh, I was dealing with other stuff, this, are, this abbreviation that you <laughs> didn't know at the beginning. And in other areas of uh, EU uh, work, uh, for example, uh, when we talk about uh, legislation, it takes much more longer time than, for example, for the cyber legislation that we have adopted or we are going to adopt uh, soon also in, in, in other area uh, of, of the cyber. Um, but uh, here we really are trying to keep up the, 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 the uh, work and, and keep up the, the speed uh, with the technology. And I know, I mean, for example, in this case, we are still running uh, a little bit behind when it comes to, for example, Internet of Things or uh, artificial intelligence so therefore i mean it's it's important to to have at least uh, some kind of common understanding uh on the basics of security uh so i agree that uh, maybe uh, it would be also good to to have a proper discussion to uh, identify what uh, security uh, is cyber security actually is uh, but um, we all got, I mean, in the case of, uh, for example, uh, uh, law application, what we always 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 saying that uh, international law, uh, which applies in uh, offline, also applies online. So whatever we ha consider as a security risk uh, offline should be also considered as security risk online. Uh, when it comes to certification, um, we have actually um, cybersecurity in Cybersecurity Act. We have identified uh, three levels of assurances, um, which are connected with the um, level of cybersecurity risk. So we have the basic, substantial, and the high. And uh, this is something that uh, actually is connected then with the uh, scheme of 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 the uh, and the. Uh, certification of the, of the products, uh, services and processes. It's always a long t title to, to mention. Uh, but uh, for, for what is important for the EU is this uh, common approach. So what uh, we also mentioned, all of us, is the uh, fragmentation. And the cyber uh, uh, market is actually very fragmented one. And uh, when, you, when we just see, you know, how many uh, different kinds of uh, certifications uh, schemes are we using, uh, what uh, standardizations, uh, so it's lots of fragmentation. And I mean, for the uh, end users, but also for the businesses, it's, it's very important that they have one common uh, ground where they can 
work with and that they can rely on because if you don't, you know, if you have several different uh, certification schemes and you don't know which one you should trust. Uh, so I think uh, it's, it's a lot of job uh, and work in front of us, but uh, uh, with uh, joint efforts from the uh, governments, but uh, with private sector and academia, of course, I think we will be able to somehow uh, uh, not over-regulate, but regulate a little bit uh, and uh, make uh, the cyberspace uh, more uh, uh, secure than actually it is right now. Thank you. I, I'll, I'll sort of briefly comment that I think, uh, actually to Tamara's point, um, the Cybersecurity Act and the um, certifications uh, schemes under it did contemplate uh, different levels of different risk. Um, I absolutely applaud uh, that approach. Um, uh, I think the the higher the level, the more use case specific you get in certification, uh, because it's usually the higher risk elements are service specific or use case specific. So um, having that approach, having three different levels, I think is 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 great. Um, if we look at the the lower levels, they are necessarily more baseline. Um, and in, in sort of to answer the question, um, there are some basic security principles that that carry through no matter what you know confidentiality, integrity, availability um, that you can embody in in most certification schemes. Um, to my earlier point, um, and I think to what Tamara was saying, is we live in a in a fast changing uh, world, so certification schemes should within them and within their definition have the ability to evolve um, and actually move with the time. Um, so, you know, without uh, blowing the, the NISAS trumpet too, too heavily, that's actually based on a number of documents that come out of 3GPP, they're called um, SCASs, um, a, a new, in essence, a security target. Um, those can change over time. The, the scheme uh, stays the same. But what you test within the scheme and the sort of the input documentation or the test targets can change with the market or, or, or with the need. So um, I think there's an element of flexibility that we that we have to anticipate and build into certification schemes to cope with market conditions and, and changes. Um, and um, and the, and the lower the lower the, the more basic it is, the more principled it gets to, to those core core principles. Um, but should be able to be extended up to, up to use cases. It's it's tricky, um, but um, we're starting to see schemes that are flexible enough to cope with such change. Thank you very much. Um, actually, I'd like to to come back to something you said uh, a few minutes ago, John, talking about the the speed of change. Um, and I, I made a note. You said life cycles are. Uh, are becoming compressed, they're speeding up. We've been saying this for many years, but that's undoubtedly true. Um, and when we evaluate and certify products, we do so at a point in time. That's again a point that you made. But yet, if it, for example, is a software product, uh, how can we have any confidence that version 7.9 is uh, secure if the certificate applies to version 7.8? And given that the, the speed of change of versions will uh, become even faster than, than it is at present, how on earth do we even start to address this point? Really good question. Um, uh, in, in the software world, I'm sure uh, most of us that have spent any time there will have an appreciation for main room, uh, major and minor version updates. Um, so that that's one way you can start to tackle this, which is um, you operate a full test regime on a major uh, that changes you know, has either significant function change or or a, a numerate number of changes, um, and a minor you would do in essence top up testing uh, to say I'm going to test the comp uh, the small component pieces um, on on top. So there is there are ways in that world that you can start to build confidence around high rates of change. Um, a lot of actually it comes down to um, uh, procedural diligence is that if you can prove that your development lifecycle um, 
adheres to a number of principles and a number of test gates, etc. Even if they're not certificated, but they're your own internal test procedures, um, the level of confidence in the product out the other, the final end of it, uh, starts to go up. So I think we have to hold. Um, uh, developers, vendors, service providers to a level of scrutiny that says it's it's not just about the product you produce, it's also how you produce it. Um, what what diligence, what rigor have you used in that life cycle of your product development life cycle? Um, and there is a, um, a, this sort of the social contract that um, if we trust vendors to produce products, then uh, part of that trust is for them to say, we will hold ourselves to a good standard, um, even if that doesn't happen to be certificated. Um, so I think it's a we're in a quid pro quo where there's got to be some level of uh, trust in the procedures, also uh, some level of proven trust in the actual testing and certification. So it's a balancing act, I think is my simple answer. Tamara, did you want to add to that? Yes, I just wanted to agree with John because uh, now I'm putting my uh, hat of uh, um, experts in, in uh, economy and not uh, cyber security. But from economic point of view, I mean, for the companies, it's important to um, re uh, not just to, to, to establish trust uh, with, the, with the, uh, their users, but also to uh, develop that trust. Uh, so, for example, what John said, I mean, the companies itself will also take care that uh, all parts of their products and, and, and the life cycles are, you know, uh, secure enough because uh, damage that can be uh, close to their image uh, can cost a lot. So the uh, actually aim of the certification is also what, for the, as said, it's very similar to what the physical world is to have uh, some kind of uh, uh, extra value for the for the uh, producers and uh, for the uh, companies because uh, this can also enhance uh, their sales and their uh, 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 market revenues. So, for example, if the certificate, if the products uh, will have uh certificate uh, from 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 the from the uh, EU uh, proper ICT certificate and uh, this something gives actually trust also to the uh, consumers but also improves the image of the company in the public so for the, i mean this is some kind of uh, 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 of tool that they can advertise so it's not just the you know the 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 uh, product itself, but this is something extra that they're get, gaining with uh, for for the uh, security of their products. So I mean, I agree with John that for the future, it's also uh, we need to rely also on the uh, on the companies that they will not jeopardize uh, the trust that uh, the consumers and the, the government and the uh, others their partners have invested in them. Yeah, thank you very much. It, it, it's an interesting uh, problem that there will not only be need for certification for, for individual products and systems, but will also be relying on the on possibly certifications of development processes and, and corporate governance. So that these things fit together. We can't just look at individual products. We can't just look at processes um, and evaluations of uh, corporate operation. We have to look at the, the totality of the guarantees that we're given by various processes and systems. Now, one thing that you mentioned, Tamara, was that the, the Cybersecurity Act has now been in force for a year, which I find quite scary because I thought it was about yesterday, but that's perhaps a reflection of my age. Um, but I realize that uh, this dreadful uh, virus may have slowed things down, but when might we expect to see products and services available uh, for sale in the high street or wherever with a stamp saying this has uh, been certified according to the an EU-approved scheme, 
And what sort of area might we expect to see product? What sort of products or systems might we expect to see? Is this something that, that we can say yet, Tamara? No, not at the time being. I mean, it's an ongoing process, so it's uh, it's very difficult to predict when we're going to see the first products. I'm As an end user, I'm hoping very soon. Uh, but uh, it also depends uh, on uh, how, how uh, quick the... Uh, uh, ECCG uh, will finish with the first uh, certification schemes, but uh, I hope I'm hoping. I mean, this is uh, something that it's uh, really uh, one of the legislation that will show it, uh, it its effects uh, effect uh, really uh, quickly in 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 the uh, everyday life, our everyday life. So uh, I'm hoping that uh, I will not give any prediction on time, but I'm hoping very soon we will be able to have to have uh, this uh, uh, stamp which we still don't know how it's going to look like. This is also the one of the questions, how we're going to design uh, the uh, stamp of the EU certificated uh, ICT products and, and, and services and processes. So uh, maybe also to, to think about how we're going to, to uh, market uh, this, this specific uh, stamp. Uh, but uh, as said, I mean, the area at the moment is the SOGA yes, this uh, uh, this is the first the first uh, certification scheme uh, that is going to be uh, put in place. But uh, what I wanted to like to say is also that we are uh, cooperating with uh, all existing uh, certification schemes. So we are not going to invent the hot water, you know. But we would like to use the experience and the um, also the uh, knowledge that exists from these uh, existing schemes and also implement uh, those those elements in the uh, European one. So I'm hoping that we will be able to provide you soon <laughs> with some good news. Uh, but at the moment, I said no, you know, dates. Thank you yes. very much. Thank you. And, and perhaps I can ask a slightly different question of, of John relating to MISAS uh, or other related schemes for 5G products and systems that they seem to have been a long time in, in gestation. Uh, when, when will we actually see a mature ecosystem, do you think? A uh, very good question. Um, thank you for asking it. Oh, um, uh, I was actually going to comment on, on, on what you said to Tamara, and I was, was going to say, you know. Uh, D defining, designing, launching, and getting market acceptance of a scheme is, is no mean feat. It takes time. Um, NISAS has been in development for a good number of years. Um, it's, it's GSMA and 3GPP in partnership. Um, I'm actually pleased to say, although I can't say whom, uh, that we have uh, two of the major five vendors already going through their initial audits and products evaluations. Um, so I would expect within the next um, couple of months, um, starting to see some initial product that is certified under the NISAS scheme. Um, we are also working with a number of uh, GSMA members, partners, and the EU and the NISA, um, and we will be proffering NISAS as one of the, the potential schemes uh, under the EU um, certification series. So, um, uh, obviously, we'll, we, we may see that as one of the schemes we, again, we're going to have to talk about branding and badging of it. Um, <laughs> haven't thought about that. Um, but uh, that that's an, an intent that we will explore that um, and take it through that construct because we fundamentally look at things like reciprocity, recognition in the EU as well as in the wider world as something that is good to do. Um, so the short answer is uh, soon for NISAS. Uh, I know it's been around for a while. It's been it's been going on for uh, a while, but that's actually allowed us to a work out a number of issues that we've encountered along the way, um, and and uh, and adapt the scheme. Um, and uh, two, I think um, more recent uh, uh, things in the in the news and the events have, have moved that schedule up, and it's become more important than ever. So uh, soon. Right, thank you. Um, I think we're coming towards the end of our scheduled time, but maybe it would be good if we each uh, spend a couple of minutes trying to sum up or raise any other issues that that um, uh, seem relevant. So, um, Tamara, is there anything else that you want to add to, to what you and 
the rest of us have said? Uh, very, very tough question. Uh, thank you very much. No, I mean, from our side, uh, we have uh, coming. We are coming to the end of our presidency, and uh, we managed to uh, have, despite the crisis, a successful presidency also in this uh, cyber and digital sphere. And uh, we have, have actually been the first digital, really digital presidency. Uh, so uh, and. Actually, this this the whole crisis has shown the, the importance of, of uh, digital and uh, with the digital technology, but also in the importance of the uh, cybersecurity of that technology. So, I mean, I'm hoping that uh, this uh, work uh, on uh, certification and, and standardization uh, will progress uh, uh, much faster, although uh, we don't want to jeopardize the quality of the work. But we, I mean, this, this whole situation has shown that we need uh, results and we need the qualitative results because uh, without the secure digital technology, I don't think that we will be able to continue uh, working and continue um, our everyday life uh, because uh, as you know, we already know, uh, it's going to change. It's going to change a lot our everyday life. So, uh, I'm hoping just that uh, we all together will be able to uh, progress and uh, to achieve uh, the uh, uh, secure environment so that, as I always said, the end users are our main target in this, to answer your question at the beginning. Yes, everybody is important, but uh, end users are, th I'm thinking, are the uh, main beneficiaries of, of this process of uh, certification and standardization of ICT products, processes, and services. So I think for them uh, that they can feel uh, safe and secure, it's our job to continue uh, to de deliver. And I'm hoping that we will be able to do that in the upcoming months. Thank you very much. John? Uh, yeah, sort of my, my sort of two minutes of closing remark are, um, first of all, um, thanks to uh, Forum Europe for setting this up and giving us a platform to have a, a great discussion. Um, uh, thanks to all that are spending time listening to us. Hopefully you're, you're keeping your interest um, after a long couple of days. Uh, but in relation to the sort of the security aspects, I think um, the current situation, COVID-19 has shown that digital digital society, digital reliance, um, the new normal is going to be heavily digitally dependent um, and it should benefit from uh, good levels of security. Um, security is in service of trust. Um, so actually consumers want trust. Um, Security is kind of what is, is an anchor of trust, but it's not the only thing. Um, so we shouldn't just focus on specifically security. It's about building that trust picture. Certification is part of that. Um, and how we do that is, is should be collectively uh, baselining um, and raising the overall level. Um, we can do that partly through um, certification, a lot through um, proof points of operation as well. Um, I obviously speak from the telco industry. We're a key enabler for lots of other services. Um, so we have to provide a trust to lots of um, players above us that they can then go and build compelling product and service upon. So um, it's it's the trust picture, I think, that uh, I'd like to focus on. But thank you. Thanks very much, John. Well, and thank you to you both. And indeed, uh, thank you to the audience. I, I've not much to say because Tamara and John between them have said all the things that I thought mentally I should cover. Um, again, I should thank everybody for, for listening and writing questions and input. It seems to me that we're in very interesting times. The, the virus crisis has accelerated uh, many areas of digital life. And as Tamara so rightly said, it just proved to everybody how much we rely on the security, reliability of digital services in our everyday lives. And certification will no doubt play a very important role in giving us the assurance we need that 
services and products deliver what they promise to deliver in a secure way. And there are many exciting times ahead. The, the certification schemes that we will be using every day in our choices about products and systems are being developed and being deployed right now, as we've heard. So watch this space and it will be interesting to have a similar discussion in a year or two and look back and say, oh, yeah, there was a time when we didn't know how certification was going to quite work. But now we have these baseline standards. We have general acceptance uh, of the need for baseline certification. And it's really useful. At least I hope and trust that that will be the case. Anyway, thanks to everyone for listening. And thanks most of all to Tamara and John for providing their expertise in this session. So that's goodbye from me and goodbye from John and Tamara. Ah, they're muted. So, okay. Thanks, Chris. Bye.